Thank you for listening. This is the Legends Podcast by All Day Vinyl. I'm your host, Scott Dettelson. After you finish this episode, please subscribe, rate, and check us out on Instagram and YouTube at All Day Vinyl. Today, I'm excited to speak with a legend, an inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a country rock pioneer. My guest is a founding member of two legendary bands, Buffalo Springfield, which he founded with Neil Young and Stephen Stills, and Poco, which he founded with Jim Messina and Rusty Young. Over the last 40 years, this gentleman has released solo albums while simultaneously serving as a pastor at the Calvary Chapel in Broomfield, Colorado, retiring from ministering just a few years ago. In 2022, he released a fantastic album called In the Country and is the subject of an upcoming documentary about his life. I'm pleased to introduce to you the great Richie Fure. Richie, thank you so much for joining. Scott, my pleasure, man. Good to talk to you. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. So let's, let's start with the present, working our way back. I've got a lot of questions for you. But I was very excited to see that there's a documentary that's been in the works about your life. And I was wondering if there's any update when we might be able to, to see that. And tell me a little more about the genesis of it. Well, I just had a sizzler sent to me that's going to be sent out to places like Sundance and Netflix to just see you know, if somebody will pick it up. It came about by my friends David Stone and Denny Klein, who really thought my life story was something unique enough to you know, want to document, I would have had no thoughts in the world to do it, but they sure did. And we started it and with everything else, COVID got in the way and kind of slowed things down, but it is in the, in the final stages right now. We were really excited to have Cameron Crow do the, the voiceovers on it. And, you know, I was Cameron's first interview years and years and years and years, well, many years ago. And it, it was funny how we reconnected to get all this started. I saw his name pop up on my social media and I thought, no, 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 no. This can't be, this isn't Cameron Crowe. So I went behind the scenes and, and cause I hadn't talked to him in years and I, I went behind the scenes and I said, Hey, Cameron, if this is you, it's really excited. I'm excited to hear your or see your name pop up. And I'm coming to California to do a concert with my friend, Timothy B. Schmidt. And if that's you, I want you to come and be my guest. And he wrote right back and said, it's me and I'll be there. And we reconnected. And it was just so cool just to reconnect with him after all those years. So he got involved with us on kind of like a temporary basis and then has really joined in to, to really do a lot of interviews and, and some other things, which has really been cool. So, you know, I've had, I've had people from Clive Davis to David Geffen to my friends that I play music with, you know, and doing little interviews. And it's, it's going to be a different story. And I'm really excited for it to come out. I mean, cause it is a pretty unique story to start, you know, a rock and roll career. And then all of a sudden, you know, have my life go upside down, my wife wanting a divorce and this and that and the other. By the way, we have been married for 57 years now. So everything's good, but. Uh, there's just a lot of ups and downs and, you know, so, and some people that were interviewed, you know, there's been some conflict with, so it's not necessarily, Hey, a pat on the back. This is the greatest guy in the world. It's a real story of a real person. Fascinating, man. So much, so much to dig into over there. And that you mentioned Cameron Pro and that uh, interview and you were his first, he must've been 14 or 15 at the time. Is that right? I think he was, I, he was 15 or 16 15. years old. I think. Yeah. He, he just yeah. started his career. <laughs> you know, Vinny, I, I read the, I read the interview recently. It was great. And it was towards the tail end of your career with Poco. And was there any recollection you have of being interviewed by him at that time? Not really. No. <laughs> no. Another, another time. Yeah. Other than the pictures that I've seen, you know, when we did do it or <laughs> yeah, crazy. Neil Young, for example, is an amazing archivist. He's collected everything that's happened in his universe. Are, are you that type of archivist where you have these, these things where you can look back and understand the time and place based on these pieces? No, I kind of live in the moment, you know, as things go by. One piece that I would really wish I had was when Neil taught me nowadays Clancy can't even sing before there was ever a Buffalo Springfield back in New York. When oh, he yeah. came by our our uh, apartment back in New York, he was he wanted to go. I mean, he came to town to pedal some songs. And uh, he stayed at our apartment and I he played me some songs and played nowadays Clancy can't even sing. And it was like 
man, I want to record this. And I'd gone to New York with a tape recorder that my dad gave my mom one Christmas, you know, and had him do it. And I can't find the reel now. I mean, that would be a classic that would be really pretty cool to have. I have no idea where it is. <laughs> Significant piece of music history right there. Yeah. And, and and let's let's go back to that because the early the early beginnings, the pre beginnings of the Buffalo Springfield are just as fascinating to me as the beginnings of it and the the history of it. So before in Buffalo Springfield, you were living in New York and playing with Stephen Stills, right, in the A Go Go Singers. Right. How did how did you come to connect originally with Stephen Stills and what was a young Stephen Stills like at that time? Well, I had I had gone to New York, first of all, with my a cappella choir from Otterbein College. And we, we saw that we had, you know, a night off. And one of the guys that I was singing with when we were in New York, I mean, this guy could sell you anything. And he went around these various little clubs. We, you know, he went, one of them was the Cafe Wa and said, hey, can we come in and play? You know, I mean, good golly, right off the street. But that was the way it was back in New York in those days. And, and I thought it was pretty cool. They, they did let us in, but you know what? They let us in when they were changing the audiences around. You know? So we were we were like the, the people movers at the time. But anyway, when we came back to New York, convinced my buddies to go back in the summertime. And Stephen was at, at this little past the basket club that we had played in called the Four Winds, which was on West 3rd Street. And uh, we became friends, and and I was I was taken right away with Stephen's uh, talent. He was, I mean, you could really see that he had a lot of talent. We became good friends. Obviously, Eddie Miller put the Agogo Singers together. We became the house band at the Cafe Agogo, which was across the street from the Bitter End. And it, in that amount of time, we were together for I don't know, maybe six months. We d we did a record for Roulette Records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Got that record. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we did a, a supper club tour of Texas. We did a Rudy Valley on broad Rudy Valley on Broadway tonight television show and an off Broadway play, which was off off Broadway in two weeks. So, I mean, a lot, a lot of excitement though in six months. And I actually then the group broke up and, and I didn't know what I was going to be doing. So I called a, a cousin of mine who was a executive up at Pratt & Whitney Aircraft. And I went up to East Hartford and went to work in handing out tools and the tool crew up there. During this time, there was a friend of mine that lived across the street from us on Thompson Street. I lived at 171 Thompson, and he lived across the street, closer up to Bleecker. And he brought me the Birds' first record up to where I was living. And he said, you've never heard anything like this. And truly, I hadn't heard anything like it. By the way, his name was Graham Parsons. And he, when I heard it, I said, I got to get a hold of Stephen and get out of here. Because even though I told him I'd be at Pratt & Whitney to get the gold watch, it was like, man, when I heard that music, it was like, man, it was in my blood, man. I had to, I had to play music. That's all there was to it. And got a, in a roundabout way, I got a hold of Stephen. The only address I knew of, of Stevens was his dad who was in, in ex imports and exports, I guess, in uh, Salvador, El Salvador. And I don't know how I had his address, didn't have Stephen's address, but I sent, I sent him a letter and I waited for a return and it seemed like it was just never coming. And finally it came back. I didn't have enough postage on the letter. <laughs> so I had to put another stamp on, send it back. And then Stephen did get in touch with me and said, come on out to California, got a band together. All I need is another, another singer and Hey, let's do it again. And so I said, let me take care of my business. Took care of that. Went out to California and the band was me and Stephen. There was no band. At first it was something like a sucker punch because I was like, I come all the way across country and and I, I was expecting there to be a band already together. But as time went on, it proved to be one of the most valuable times for Stephen and I, because we were in this little apartment on Fountain Avenue or Fountain, I guess, Fountain Boulevard, Fountain Avenue. I think it was Avenue. Yeah, Fountain Avenue. And we were in this tiny little apartment. That's what Stephen had. And we, we just sat across from each other. And just sang all of the songs, learned all of the songs that he had for the first record, Buffalo Springfield record. And we learned how to phrase together, harmonize together, sing in unison together. It was just, it was a perfect time when you look back on it now. And, you know, then during one of these times, 
you know, Stephen had met Neil and I'd met Neil and Neil had come to California looking for Stephen because they had played together up in Canada. Stephen was working his way across to get to California and couldn't find him. And here goes this story that, I mean, you can't make it up. We were both on Sunset Boulevard. We were going east and Neil and Bruce, he had Bruce Palmer, Neil had Bruce Palmer with him. And we got stuck in traffic, of course, on Sunset Boulevard, but we got stuck and right across, you know, a Ben Frank's a little restaurant was right there. And, but in, tra- in a traffic jam, we stopped, we, we said, you, I know, you know, we went across and, you know, and ended up in that parking lot. And that was the beginning of Buffalo Springfield right there. And, came back to the little apartment and played Neil. Nowadays, our little, because I taught, you know, I did that with Steven, you know, after he taught it to me in New York, you know, and so that was the beginning of it though. (laughs) That's absolutely amazing. And, and were you, were you writing songs as well at that time? Yeah, but I was, I was playing with it. Yeah. Uh, Steven and I both wrote a, sold a song once to uh, Screen Gems, I think it was, during this period of time. The song he did was Sit Down, I Think I Love You, which ended up on the first record and done by the Mojo Man. My record or song was a song called My Kind of Love that I don't even know. I think it was recorded on some on some Poco record somewhere along the line. But yeah, so I, I was writing, but really didn't. It, my, my, I didn't really start to get anything recorded until one day I was doing this. We were doing the second Buffalo Springfield record and I was waiting for the guys to come to the studio and I was just sitting playing a sad memory. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, when I, when I played it, you know, I'd gone over it two or three times and just waiting for the guys to come. And all of a sudden the talk back came out and it was Neil and said, we got to record that song, you know, and basically that ended up being the recording and Neil went out and put some guitar on it. And that was it that ended up on the second, on the second record. And so that was the first, first song that I ever got recorded. And after that, then, you know, I just, you know, was working my way to try to learn about writing songs. Amazing. And on the, that first record, you did a lot of the singing. How did it come to be that you were singing nowadays and uh, Flying on the Ground is Wrong and a couple of the other Neil, Neil tunes? Yeah. You know, everybody kind of thought Neil had this uh, different voice and it was a different voice, but that's what made it unique. And that's what makes Neil Neil and, and all, but you know, they figured, okay, they've got me in the band now. What are they going to do? <laughs> so they let me sing a couple of his songs. And I was really happy to do it. I actually did them in a medley from that first album, Flying on the Ground is Wrong. Nowadays, Clancy can't even sing. And do I have to come right out and say it, which I really feel should have been the first Buffalo Springfield single release. I think Atlantic made a big mistake by not releasing that song. I think it was so much more accessible than nowadays Clancy can't even mm-hmm. sing, which is kind of esoteric. I mean, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the lyrics are kind of obscure and, and, and the going from the three, four to the four, four, I think was a little too complicated, but boy, do, do I have to come right out and say it anyway? That's just my take on it. But it was so funny when uh, Buffalo Springfield got together for our reunion about, I don't know, when was it? Maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. Now we did a reunion and Neil had gotten in touch with me and said, Hey, come on out and let's just let's go over some songs by ourselves before we do this. And so I, you know, we went out there and, and, you know, he knew that, you know, we'd be doing, couple of his songs and i said man i put these in a medley you know and i i, I think they're pretty cool you know and i play for you. he said no every song has to stand on its own and so we ended up only doing i think two of the songs clancy and did we do do i have to come right out and say it we didn't we didn't do flying on the ground is wrong but anyway that was just neil's little quirk he said every song kind of stand on its own but during my, you know, part of my solo stuff, I've always, I haven't done it recently, but early on, I put this little medley together, which I thought was pretty cool, but. I've seen it and it's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, history, history has shown that Neil is very singular with his vision of how his art is presented. What was your experience in those early days with translating his songs and working with him and how to do that? You know, I was just, they, they were just given to me and presented to me. We actually did, I won't call it auditions, but for like when it got around to Mr. Soul at one time, which Neil ended up singing, but Steven sang it and I sang it and we all tried, you know, to see how it goes. But on the first record, you know, it was just here, here are some, here you do these songs. And I think maybe because of Clancy, 
that he had already taught me, and I knew that one, you know, as complicated as it was, that the other ones just seemed like more maybe something that that I would be, you know, be more conducive to what I, you know, might feel for it. But there was seemed to be no problem with it. I think, you know, Neil obviously wanted to sing his own songs, and I don't blame him for that. And of course, he's got two or three on the first album and on the second album, the same thing. But the ones that I did, I think he, I think he thought I did well, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, I, I think today, as I look at it, you know, I think I, I do them better today than I did back then. Cause I, I was developing in a lot of ways back then, you know, I mean, the, I felt like Steven was a lot further along. I don't think of Neil as that point in time, but I know from just playing with Steven, I just felt like he, he, he was certainly a lot further along, and I really look at, you know, what what I learned from him, especially as we sat together in that little apartment, you know, learning to sing and phrase and harmonize together and all that time that we spent alone. Aside from the birds, who was influencing you to at that time? What kind of what were you listening to and deriving the inspiration? Well, at that particular time, I was listening to a lot of folk music. You know, because I mean, there, there's a transition that was happening at that time, you know, from I mean, I went to New York to be a folk singer, as I think Stephen did at the same time. And but there was a there was a transition. So I was listening a lot of commercial Peter Paul and Mary Kingston trio and, and groups like that. Earlier on influences was more rockabilly. Mm. I mean, from the more popular, probably Buddy Holly, but to Gene Vincent and Carl Perkins and 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 those kind of guys, you know, Eddie Cochran back in the day, those were I, I really that that was a lot of my influence. I like that rockabilly stuff. <laughs> and is there do you have any any specific memory when you look back at that first Springfield album, which you've talked about as the true Springfield, because there's the yep. the five of you in the studio. Any specific memories or rec- recollections that stand out from being in gold star at that time recording any any of these songs you know i think it was really we looked upon it we we were all very young and and you know just uh, we were actually doing what we came to california to do and for me it was just like wow it's really happening at this point in time and obviously going to Gold Star and, and, and recording at, you know, a very significant, famous uh, studio. We recorded our first record on four track. So that was crazy. Or yeah, four track. But, and then playing at the, at the Whiskey Go Go, the band was the best. And, and we were, it just seemed like an exciting time. It wasn't until just right after that that I, I don't know, you know, Neil's quirkiness started to happen and, and he was here, he was there, he was gone. And then we had issues, you know, other issues. And, and it was like in two years time, we had nine people in and out of the band, the five original and four other people. And it was just like, one step forward and two steps back it was hard to hard to keep it moving but for two years we made an impact oh yeah it's significant and you know the there's a legend or a mythology that child's claim to fame which is on the buffalo springfield Al- again album is about neil young is yeah that, is there a truth actually, to, to that he actually questioned me about that but uh yeah i mean it it, it was I, you know, I, I don't know that I was thinking about the lyrics as they were coming out. I, I don't know how it all just came about. It just, there it was, there was a song. But when we were doing our reunion tour again, we were in Santa Barbara and I got past the intro. Da 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 da. You know, Neil said, wait, 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 stop everything. Did you write that song about me? <laughs> it's like, I here I am in front of 5,000 people and he's questioning me about the song, you know, after all those years. And it's like, oh, well, mm, yeah. <laughs> on the, on the credit, on the credits, he played on the song as well. And also James, James Bird, uh, not, James, yeah, James, James Bird on Dobro. Yeah. Amazing. Any recollection of that recording session? I wasn't in the studio when James came in and I love James. I mean, yeah. I, Ricky Nelson was a huge influence of mine. And of course, James Burton played with him. I had the honor of going down to, now I can't remember if it was Louisiana or Arkansas, wherever he has a little festival every once in a while. And I got, I, I'm not a guitar player, so I don't really know why I was invited down there, but I was invited down and it was fun to just meet him after all of these years because what an influence. I really think he had a big influence on Jimmy Messina's guitar style and all that. But James was, he was great. What a wonderful, wonderful guy and, and all. But I, I missed the, 
I the, the one thing that I have heard over the years, and I don't know anything about it, but uh, he never got paid. Oh, wow. <laughs> he never got paid. And I think that was Atlantic's business or whoever was, you know, the, the producers of, of Buffalo Springfield at the time, which I don't know if Green and Stone still had, you know, producers credit on the second record. I'd have to go back and look and see if they did. I don't think so. I think we were, and maybe it was my fault if I got credit for producing that song. <laughs> and and I read in an, an article, it was from, I think, 1971, where you mentioned Expecting to Fly, and that was a song that you had hoped to had sing. Was there ever any any time where you, you did take a lead vocal on, on that song? No. And uh, it was one of the songs that, uh, you know, I really liked. And, and, and Neil, of course, went off with Jack Nitsche and, and was doing a lot of stuff outside the group because the first record was the only record that the, that the original band played on. And everything, you know, there were, there were a couple songs on the second one and maybe one or two songs on the, on the third album that the, that the band played on. The rest of it was. And so when, I think when Neil went off and, and just did it with Jack Nitsche, it just became, you know, his song. And I want to talk real quick about the birds because you mentioned early on that it's amazing that the birds were what got you to California. And then ultimately Chris Hillman and Crosby were catalysts to help you guys go forward. What, what was that relationship like with those guys at that time? And how did it end up that Crosby played with the Springfield at, at Monterey? You know, yeah. Both Chris and David were in, influential helping get us into. Even the Whiskey A Go Go, you know, to to become a house band, basically. There, they they both like us, and, and you know, yes, we we were all friends. I've always kept a low profile in my career. I've never been a hangout guy where I just need to feel like I got to be seen someplace and do something. So, you know, my my friendships were more, you know, that they weren't as 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 deep. Where hey, let's go out and have you know a uh, you know, go to go to lunch or do something together. You know, I mean, it was like we'd see each other and, and it would just be a, a friendly thing. So, yeah, we hung out like like we were. We were friends. You know, how David got involved was, well, of course, Neil, that was one of the times when Neil decided that he wasn't going to, you know, be a part of the band. And, and probably I think it was through uh, Stephen and David's relationship that David said, hey, let me, I'll sit in with you guys. But, you know, I mean, and, and David's, a, David's a singer. He's another rhythm guitar player. He's not a lead guitar player or wasn't. And, you know, so it was a, it was a little strange. I don't think we really did a very good job at Monterey. Yeah, I think it's it was a little loose, but there's this myth, job, there's still man. there's a mythology to it all though. You know, just from the the time of the festival and you know what it later happened with Stephen Stills and Crosby forming uh -huh. CSN. Definitely a, it, it's significant in that realm. And then I want to ask you about last time last time around and a couple of curiosities on it. There's there's one Hard to Wait, the second song on the album, I think it's a co-write between you and Neil Young. Is what's what's the backstory on on that? Well, it was a song that that I had started, and you know, I think I pl I think I played it for Neil, and I don't I I don't even know what he added to the song, or or I really don't know because we didn't sit down and say, hey, we're going to write a song together. It was a song that, that I had that I'd already started me and, you know, Neil added something. And I, I think we did that on another song that's on that album, but I did not get credit on that one. <laughs> and so, which one, which one was that? Well, on the way home, I kind of had, well. some, I had some stuff on, you know, that I feel like I, I contributed to that and, and I'll be, Hey, you know what, man, it, it's no big, it, it's just one of those things. I had a, I had a song, interestingly enough, you know, it's hard when you sit down and try to write something with somebody. I don't know how Bernie Taubin and Elton John, you know, I mean, they are Lennon and McCartney, uh, you know, I mean, these guys that sit down and write because every song that I've written with somebody where I had a co-write, even in some of my solo career with one of the guys that I played with for so long, Scott Sellen, you know, we, we did sit down together, but you know what? We never, it was, all, I'm going to take this home now and work on it. I don't know if it's because, you know, you sit there and, 
oh boy, that stinks. You know, I don't want anybody to ever hear that, you know, and then try it again until you get something. Yeah, I like that. I'll go show this to him now, you know, but so I don't, I don't really remember. I mean, Neil and I did not sit down and say, he probably said, here, man, this is a part of this song that, that it kind of fits and it sounds good. What do you think? And I, I thought, well, sounds all right to me. Let's do it. You know. And then the, the, the other, there's another very interesting curiosity on the album, which is the hour of not quite rain, which is an interesting co-write. Maybe you could tell, because it's not really, if you look at the album, you can't really tell the backstory of that song, but that song backstory is pretty fascinating. You don't well, mind sharing it. Very interesting song. It was KHJ, which was a big radio station in Los Angeles at the time, an AM radio song or station. And it was a contest. You write the lyrics and Buffalo Springfield will write the music to the song and it'll become a hit. <laughs> Gosh. Well, Neil wasn't interested. Stephen wasn't interested. Dewey could have cared less. And so, you know what? Bruce picked Bruce Palmer picked the lyrics and I was the last guy standing, you know, is to write the music. And so basically I wrote the music and it, and it, it became really a, a very strange song. A lot of people listen to it and they say, this is a very interesting and strange song. And yes, it is a very interesting. And, and I, I will say that it stretched me, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't something that I would normally write because when you're writing at somebody else's lyrics, it, you know, you, it, it's just difficult. And I wouldn't call myself a, a, a really musical major in college or whatever, you know, where oh, I can figure this out. This is no problem here. You know, it was something that I just kind of, kind of came and there, there it was though, but it was interesting. You know, those lyrics are, are kind of, they're, they're, they are different. It's a different lyric and it's a different melody. And there it was. Neil wouldn't even put that on one of the box sets that we did. He, I don't think he liked it at all. But then there's some people that complained. Why wasn't that song on the box set? You know, I really like it. But it was so that that was it, though. It was a KHJ contest. You write the lyrics, Springfield will write the, the music to it. And Bruce picked the lyrics and said, here. <laughs> yeah, cool. And, you know, before before you guys broke up, there was well. First of all, did you see that the movie it's called Echoes in the Ca Echo in the Canyon? Uh -huh. Canyon. So that which was which was great. I love. I, I enjoyed it. And Stephen Stills recounts a story that was towards the end of the Buffalo Springfield, which was you guys were in Topanga Canyon, which is about a mile from where I'm at right now. And uh, you were with Eric Clapton and Neil and Messina, and you were jamming. And there was an incident that happened on that, and. Stills recounted it from his perspective, and he's the one who escaped from that incident. So I'd, I'd be curious yeah. to hear from from you a little of the backstory of that and your recollection of the incident at the Topanga House. Well, the, the police came twice. They came one night and they said, listen, you know what? And we, I mean, truthfully, we thought we were in the woods and no one was around, you know, but they came and they said, knocked on the door, said, look, you guys at 10 o'clock or whatever hour, you know, you got to bring it down, you know, because uh, a lot of noise out here and people, you know, want their peace and quiet. And, and so they left. And the next night we were playing and jamming and doing it again. And I had left and, and my wife and I had, had left the evening. And then I remembered that, oh, Jimmy was going to go shopping with me the next day to, to go get a, a stereo system. And we went back. And I tell you, Scott, we were in the house less than five minutes. And the next thing I know, man, people are coming in the doors, in the window, everywhere in the world, you know. And we were arrested and taken down to the Malibu police station. Nancy went down. She ended up actually at Sybil Brand down at the at the lake. I mean, if you'd known, if you know my wife, man, I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't work, man. But we all went to the Malibu police station and then down to LA County. And, and we were fortunate enough to have known, and we were getting ready to do a beach boys tour. And so that's how we got really bailed out. But I can remember walking into a jail cell, man, down at LA County. And I walked in and there was like four bunks in this cell. And there was one guy in the cell and he was laying on his bed and he just said, that one's yours. And it's like, <laughs> 
yeah, no problem, man. So I got on my bed, man, and hung out and waited until somebody came to get me after going through the whole routine. I do remember as we walked into the Malibu police station, there was a, a big metal door with then little bars across the top. And there was a guy sitting in there and he was singing one of Clapton's songs. I have a, a cream song or something, you know, and it was like, this is the strangest thing in the world. But what a nightmare it was, man. I mean, the, the police came in, took us away. And I know that Nancy's mom, she read about it in the LA Times. It made the headlines of the LA Times. That's how she heard her daughter went to jail that night. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, man. <laughs> so it was, it was quite a, quite a fiasco. But uh, fortunately, you know, because we were working with the Beach Boys at the time, they got us out and. I, the only thing, the rest of it, I just remember is I had to go and testify, testify for Eric Clapton so he could come back and work. I mean, don't even think Eric even remembers it anymore, but. What, what a time. I mean, you know, thinking about in 1967, 68, you could get arrested for smoking a joint and playing loud music. We live in a different day and age, man. Totally. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Thank it you. was pretty scary. I mean, you know, the whole routine of just going from. You know, from Topanga to Malibu to downtown LA, to, it's like, you know, <laughs> it was it was a scary time. And the the last show you guys played was just a few weeks later in Long Beach. Did you did you know that that the end was happening at that point? Yeah, pretty much so. You know, I always I've always thought and always said that you know the the Springfield was Stephen song was his band. I really believe that the Springfield was. He was the heart and soul. And I said, I'll be there as long as Steven's there. When Steven decides that, you know, it's time to time to call it a day and move on to something else, then, you know, I'll move on to something else too. And and Jimmy and I had become good friends and had already talked about, uh, you know, what we were going to, you know, do, how we were going to proceed. You know, after that, we weren't just, I wasn't going back to Pratt and Whitney and he wasn't going to, you know, we wanted to play. But when, you know, when we, we knew it was over. and. So when it was over, you know, Jimmy and I just started to pick up the pieces, if you will. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's it's amazing and very fitting that the final song on the final Buffalo Springfield album is Kind Woman, about your wife, who you've been with for 57 years. Yeah. This is, the, uh, this is the song in which you, Jimmy, and ultimately met Rusty Young uh -huh. to start Poco. Abs absolutely, absolutely incredible. You know, any, any recollections of that, those first meetings with Rusty Young and how it, how you, the three of you, I know you were talking with Jimmy before, but you and Rusty ultimately got in the fold to, to start the band. Well, as we were talking about it, obviously, you know, we thought that this was a good song to be a catalyst to what we wanted to do. I mean, it had a country feel to it. And, you know, we were thinking about putting a steel guitar on the song. A road manager, su manager uh, suggested, hey, I know this steel guitar player, young guy back in Denver. And uh, he's a friend and he's the greatest steel guitar player in the world. And Tim and I just said, OK, sight unseen. What are we going to lose, man? We'll fly him out here and, and get him to play on the song. And so when Rusty came, I guess he, he I guess his guitar never made it. His steel guitar didn't make it on, you know, during. For the time of the session so he used a, a guitar that he or a steel guitar that he wasn't even comfortable with or whatever but i'll tell you what that 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 song now with him on it you know has made a lot of uh, an impact on a lot of people i know dan dugmore is on our documentary and dan's a good friend of mine and and he said you know hearing that steel guitar that, hearing that on kind woman he said that's what made me want to pick up the steel guitar but jimmy and i you know as we're sitting there we looked at each other and said yeah, this guy, let's see what we got here. And so we talked to Rusty if he wanted to join the band or, or actually start a band with us. And he said, yes. And so we were short a drummer and we were short a bass player. And the Rusty said, hey, I got a drummer back in Denver that's really good. And he sings good and, and plays good. And so he <coughs> invited George out and George became our drummer. And what a great asset to Poco. I mean, George was the unsung hero for sure of Poco. He could, he could just sing. He had a good ear. And I mean, to play some of the parts that he played, he was a terrific drummer and, and, and on. I love him so much, but so we had that. And then we start auditioning bass players for Poco, you know, after the band, you know, after, you know, last time around and Rusty was on the record and now we're starting a new band. 
And the two bass players you interviewed were two legendary bass Randy players. Randy Meisner and Timothy B. Schmidt, man. Poco became the farm team for the yeah. Eagles bass players, man. Yeah. How do you choose? How do you choose between one of these two guys? Both yeah. It, it was difficult, you know, because I think we auditioned. From my recollection, we auditioned them on the same day. I don't know if that back that was 50 years ago i can't really remember all i remember is uh, i was going through a bunch of art of uh, stuff that i had letters and in a box someplace and i was just going through it all oh, this is probably about five six seven years ago and i found this letter that timothy wrote and he wrote back and said hey thanks a lot for the opportunity to audition i know that you'll make the best choice possible you know but i just want you to know that i really appreciate the opportunity that you gave me and so I got that letter. I got it framed and I sent it to him, you know, because it probably fits in his up on his, you know, whatever, as, as well as it does mine. But there were there were some issues with a couple guy, well, one guy in particular in the band that really felt that, you know, they liked Randy a lot better than they liked Timothy. And so, you know, we gave the, you know, and Randy great and talented and, and just wonderful, you know, player and, and singer. And so it was a hard choice. But, you know, as, as time would have it, when we were recording the first album, there became issues with Randy wanting to sit in. It's really difficult when you're recording, especially with Jimmy not being able to. He was an engineer and he, you know, because Columbia had union people, he couldn't put his hands on on the board to do mixing. And it's very subtle and very difficult. And so if Jimmy, oh, man, I need this just here, you know, and and if there's too much going on in the studio, you know, because somebody, if you're if me, I'm sitting there. Well, man, I need my voice a little higher. I need this a little, you, better, you know, and then you got. Yeah. The, oh, I need to pay. So we just said, look, we got to get it to a certain point and then we'll let everybody, you know, you know, voice their opinions and, and we'll take notes and see what we do to to readjust it, you know, and. Randy wasn't satisfied with that. And that's when he left. And that's when we went, you know, I went up to Sacramento. Timothy had gone back up to Sacramento and I, you know, we stopped in and heard him play one night and he knew why we were there. <laughs> he he joined a band at that, at that particular moment in time. And Timothy, I've become great friends over the years. I mean, he's played on as many of my solo projects as I can get him on and you know, I've opened up for him when he's been doing solo things, and he's he's just a really really good friend. It seems like a very kind man. Right? Oh, sweet! He's one of the sweetest. And and you know, I find it interesting that time when you started Poco, that LA scene, and I'm curious why and how did it evolve into like a country rock scene? Because it wasn't just you guys. Graham Parsons was there doing stuff with the Birds. Uh, Gene Clark was doing stuff with Dillard and Clark. Michael Nesmith was doing his stuff. Uh, yeah. How, why was this country scene? How did it evolve in Los Angeles? And it doesn't seem natural. You know, I, I, I have no idea other than, you know, I guess everybody like myself, you know, that was, well, Graham and I had talked about putting a band together. Yeah, tell, me when, about, tell me about that. When he came out to LA, you know, he, he was, he was working with the birds and he was thinking about putting a band together and we talked about it and, and we just couldn't sort out, you know, how we're going to split the people up. You know, I was very satisfied with, with who I had in the band and for the band that I had. And he was, he was too, but how are you going to change it around? So it, it never, it never did happen. But if you talk to, to like Chris, he'll even tell you, man, we were a country band. Mm -hmm. We weren't a country rock band. We played every country dive, you know, out there in the Los Angeles area. But yeah, the birds was sweetheart of the rodeo and Michael Nesbitt, you know, the, he was, it, it was, it was just something that was just germinating at the time in, in LA. Now I had written child's claim to fame, which obviously was country right. and kind woman, you know, which had a country feel to it. So it was something that was in, in my heart, that, that kind of style of music anyway, and and so it was just evolving at the time. It's interesting that Poco had their picking up the pieces record. We, we were working on it before the birds sweetheart of the rodeo actually came out. And, and so, you know, but, but Hey man, you got to give them credit for what they did. I mean, Chris had a lot of bluegrass stuff going on with him and, and, uh, and also it was just, there was just a scene that was happening and, 
it was filling a gap that was just supposed to happen at the time, you know, like doo wop happened back in New York one time. And here we got some country stuff going now. That's really, that's really cool stuff. And on, on that first Poco album, you had What a Day, which I, I heard on a Buffalo Springfield box set. There was a demo previous. Were there any other songs that you had done for Poco, either live or, de- or thought about doing that were left over from the Springfield era? Well, the only other one would have been My Kind of Love, which was a song that I still don't even... Yeah, it was on, I think, one of the later albums, Poco albums, but that was a song that that I did. And it's interesting, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band did a country version of that, and I did kind of like... I don't know what kind of version of it, because it was a it, it was a difficult time in my life, but I did a whole... It was it was just it's funny how you can take a song and one group will play it this way because I think the original way did have a little more country to it and that's why the Dirt Band picked it up and played it on one of their albums but um, I think that was the only one and that the on the, on the box set what a day Stephen actually sang it I think and that was really an honor for me to have him sing one of my songs you know <laughs> that was really cool that was really cool. And then I want to talk a little on Graham Parsons again from Crazy Eyes. I've actually got that album right over here. I was listening to it last night. All right. I love it. And I have, I have a couple of questions. One, Brass Buttons, which you cover on, which was released, I think, right before Graham passed away and before Graham even put it on one of his own albums. Do you, did uh, Graham know that you were covering this? Or do you have any idea if he ever heard your, your Poco version? I don't know because he taught it to me when we were friends back in New York. When we were both, you know, living, a, you know, that's where I learned the song back then. I thought, good golly, man, this is really a pretty interesting song, you know, for a young guy like him to be writing. And for years, I, I mean, I really didn't even know that it was about his mom, you know, but I loved the song. I thought the song was, it, it just really touched me, you know, it was a really, really sweet song. And I don't know that he, that he knew that I was recording it or not. I don't know. You do, you do a beautiful job on it. And then Crazy Eyes, which is also when we talk about <laughs> mythology, the mythology is that that's also about Graham Parsons. Is that? Well, some aspects of it. I, I definitely, I definitely stole, you know, I mean, if, if you look ever, you know, in speaking to Graham, you could look in his eyes, you know, and he was, they were kind of bushy and you looked into him and you could see there was something weird in there, you know, cause Graham was a, he, he was a, he was an interesting kind of, kind of guy to, to, to i mean and so i crazy eyes and then i talked about you know growing south carolina pines where he grew up and this and that and the other so i guess you got to put some kind of connotation to the song had had something about a gram but it was a song that i had written years ago i mean before it was ever recorded as a just a simple little folk song and that's how we recorded it and jack richardson who was the producer at the time was working with Bob Ezrin. And he said, let me, let me send this to Bob and let him orchestrate this. And I said, Hey, have at it. Let's see what happens. And man, it came back and it was like, wow, oh, yeah. this an is open. an epic. This oh, is yeah. an epic. <laughs> oh yeah. It's so amazing. And rusty steel inside of it. Yeah. Oh, well, just so beautiful. And then it, it, I find it, that second side of Crazy Eyes to be just perfect with Magnolia, then the song that closes that you do. I just, I think it's tremendous. Yeah, and thank a, you. A great coda to your, your time with uh, Poco as well, I feel. Yeah. And Jack was a, a great guy to work with at the same time. You know, we were looking for that. We kept looking for that producer that was going to produce that hit record for us because he was, you know, involved with the Guess Who back in up in Canada, you know. And, and you know, I wanted Richie Podler to actually be the the producer. We finally got him for the first Souther Home and Fure record. But, yeah, Crazy Eyes, you know, turned out to be quite a classic. And I think Jack had a lot to do with, you know, just the idea. Let me send this off to Bob Ezrin, you know, because Bob will... He'll he'll give a he'll give a little twist to it, you know, which would be cool. And it was, man. When we heard it, it was like, oh yeah. Really beautiful. And then, then you mentioned Souther Home and Fure, which is your your next venture, which changed oh. your life in the most maybe significant way. Tell me tell me about how that impacted you beyond music. Okay, yeah. I I, um, I became disillusioned. The Poco was ever going to, you know, make. and at this point, it, it had changed from just let's just play the music and have a good time to, well, I got to take care of my family now. So that means I have to make some money doing this, you know, and and then then, you know, I saw Stephen and Neil, you know, go on to, 
you know, just phenomenal success. And I'm sitting back and man, we're just laying there, you know, nothing's really happening with Poco. And so that's when we got Jack to come in and, and record the, the Good Feeling to Know album. And we thought for sure that Good Feeling to Know was going to be a hit. I mean, there was, I mean, everybody, when we, recorded the song when we released the song we thought it was going to be a hit and when it just it didn't i don't know that it even hardly charted you know it, it just left an emptiness in my in my heart and and so i came you know we'd gone on tour when when i first heard when it was just first released we were back doing every s-u-n-y back in new york man i mean it was like every gymnasium you can imagine you know and we're on our way to a gig and and uh, the radio's on and all of a sudden it was well i'm traveling down a road trying to listen my load God. you know and it's like oh my gosh there's the eagles you know and it just my heart just sank came home talked to david geffen and David basically said, well, Chris Hillman's looking for something to do. And J.D. Souther is looking for something to do. You know, why don't we just put together another Crosby, Stills, and Nash? And I'm thinking, that's all there is to it. That's all you have to do today. You know, and anyway, Chris and J.D. and I got together. And and it was, you know, it was, it was difficult. Sometimes what looks good on paper doesn't always translate into reality. Chris and J.D. and I are still friends. You know, I, I mean, obviously I've worked with Chris before and, and, and JD, golly, man, I mean, just a, a great guy and, and we're, we're still friends, but you know what? It didn't connect and probably it didn't connect because at the time I was having a crisis in my life that I didn't even know was happening. And part of it happened when my wife became a Christian and, uh, Chris wanted Al and, and Al Perkins. He wanted Al Perkins in the band because he had played with him in Manassas. And Chris had the, I mean, Al had this little sticker on his guitar that said, Jesus is Lord. And I said, no, no way, man. I don't want this guy in the band because he'll stop us from becoming, you know, the success that I think, you know, and what, why he could have been anything, but he was a Christian. And why did that stop me, you know, from wanting him in the band? But anyway, <clears throat> he did get in the band. I became a believer. And then Nancy and I separated after seven years of being married. We separated for seven months. And it was a struggle, you know, getting all of this together, man. I thought become a Christian, you had blue skies, green lights, and tops down weather, you know. And, and hey, no, it's just life like everybody else, man. And you got to struggle with it. But we had the Lord to, to help us. And without him, we wouldn't have made it. But I, I, I basically said, you know what? I'm done with, I'm done with everything. The most important thing for me in my life right now is my family and I got to get them back together. And so we only made two records. We made a record right up at Caribou Ranch, which at the time was only like maybe five miles away from my home with Tommy Dowd. Mm. And it's like, I don't even remember making the record, man. My mind was so, so exploded away, but it was a difficult time, but it was a great time. You know, I mean, Souther Hillman Fure could have probably been a different, a different band. Of course, there was the, the drama with Jim Gordon. You know, I mean, we had great guys and I mean, Paul Harris on keyboard, Al on guitar and Dobro and banjo and every instrument you can imagine. He is a terrific player. I mean, a really, and then Jimmy Gordon, who had three sets of drums going around LA at the time doing all these sessions, you know, and it just, I don't know for Scott, for whatever reason, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen, man, but. There, there you. <laughs> but it seems like there was divine, inter you know, the fact that you ended up in that place in that time with Al Perkins. Yeah. Without, that perhaps it would have been, you, you know, you may not be married. You may not. Be That's seen. right. Yeah. You know, it feels like when I look at your story and I listen to your story, there's a lot of these, like, you have to believe in God. You have to believe in yeah. something. What are like, how do all these things line up? And then, and, it's it's pretty remarkable and then so after after that you stopped doing music for a while and you were ministering what yep. what brought you back to music you know it was interesting i, I had a, a friend of mine who was a, a writer his name's kenny weisberg and he was a friend of mine back here he was actually on kbco on the radio as well as writing for the boulder camera and when kenny left Colorado, he went out to San Diego and he was the promoter at Humphreys by the Bay, mm -hmm. the, the club out there. And, and out of the clear blue, he called me one time and said, Hey man, why don't you come out and, and, and do a concert out here? Well, man, I said, Kenny, I haven't done anything, man, probably in seven, eight, nine years. You know, I don't know what, you know, I'll find the perfect concert for you. 
And so, you know, that was basically the starting of me putting bands together again. That that particular time, he had me come out with just my friend that I played with for many, many, many years, uh, whose name is also Scott, Scott Sellen. We went out as a duo and opened up for Stephen. And then the next thing we know, we have a little band where we're adding people to the band and we come out, we open up for Emmylou Harris. And then we headline the thing ourselves one time. And uh, so just one thing just catapulted into the other. And I just started playing music again. And it was uh, something that I had to kind of balance my life because at that time I, 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 I had become a believer and I became a pastor. And so, I mean, my life was like turning in one way and going the other way. And, and it was like, how do I balance all of this out? And, and it, it, you know, it became a challenge, particularly for the church. But then again, you know, when I started Poco, Poco was too country for rock and too rock for country. Mm -hmm. And then I became a believer. And when I released my first record on Asylum Records, uh, my first solo album, it was too Christian for the world and too worldly for the Christian. Because you can't find the name of Jesus on that album any place. But everything is about putting my life back together, you know, with my wife and the Lord being instrumental in that. So it was, it's, it's, that, that's part of the, the, the documentary, you know, it's just like a crazy, crazy life story, man. You put out a record a few years ago and are you, are you still writing music, recording music or scoring it yeah, all? I'm yeah. still writing music. I don't know how I just, uh, I had to write a song for the documentary that I, that I wrote. And yeah, I'm not one of these guys that is such a pro prolific writer and, uh, you know, one of the producers of the, uh, of the documentary, Denny kept saying, man, we got to have this song for the end of the doc. You got to have this song, you know, and I said, Denny, you know, if it comes, it comes, if it doesn't come, I can't force it, you know, and one day I'm riding in the car and all of a sudden there it was. And I put it down. And so I, I, I have recorded that at a friend's studio downtown and then I uh, went out to hear John Jorgensen and his band, his bluegrass band. Oh, I don't know. This was right after the first of the year. And I just sat back there, man, in a little tiny place. I mean, this guy, John's a number one, he's a phenomenal player, but what a great, sweet guy, you know? And he helped put together the whole thing with the Western Western Edge. We got a big display in Nashville at the Country Rock Music Hall of Fame out there now. And, and then he's out playing with Elton John. And then he's playing at this little tiny place called the the... Gary Theater or something back here in Boulder. And we went down to hear him. I'm just sitting there, man. And this just brought a smile on my face. And I, I wrote a song called The Bluegrass Boys. You know, came home and just wrote a song. So I'm writing if it's for no one else but me. There you go, man. I but I said, that. Yeah. I love it. Well, Richie, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for everything, man. The, the legacy you, you've built is incredible. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you for listening to the Legends Podcast by All Day Vinyl. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate it, share it, subscribe, and follow us and check us out at All Day Vinyl on Instagram and YouTube.